Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, host of the Better Off Podcast. Today, we're talking about how to make smarter decisions when you don't have all the facts with World Series of Poker champion Annie Duke. So let's not get totally surprised and unprepared if we don't get the return that we were expecting or the market goes down a thousand points in one day. Let me think about, well, you know, there are going to be days where the market crashes. So I'm going to decide in advance that on those days, I'm not going to react to it because one day doesn't really matter. I'm investing for the long term. So that would be an example of sort of preparing for the worst. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. We're sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. What a treat we have for you today. Poker players rejoice. Non-poker players rejoice. Our guest is Annie Duke. She has written a great book. It's called Thinking in Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. Annie is a World Series of Poker bracelet winner, the winner of the 2004 Tournament of Champions, and the only woman to win the National Poker Heads Up Championship. So what does she do now? She's written this book, but she wants to basically use what she learned from playing poker to help you make better decisions in your life. And I think that's so cool because what we understand as investors is similar to what poker players understand. And that is uncertainty is in the entire pursuit. Poker has uncertainty. Investing has uncertainty. Uncertainty makes us nuts. So what can you do to better manage it? That's what we're talking about. Here's our interview with Annie Duke. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Annie Duke, author of Thinking in Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. Welcome to Better Off. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Tell me one thing before we get started. You ready? Okay, I think. What is the best money decision you've made in your life? The best money decision I've made in my life. You know what's interesting about it? It's probably a decision that where I decided not to do something with my money. What's that? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's the thing. There's so many decisions that, you know, I never checked to see how they turned out. But I, I, I would bet that it's something that I didn't do with my money. Let's talk about those bets. You are um, a World Series of Poker champion. I am. Tell the story about how you started playing poker competitively first. Well, it's a little bit of a weird, windy story. Poker didn't get on TV till 2002. I started playing in the 90s, so you can imagine it would, for anybody, it would have to be a windy story, but particularly for a woman. So here's what happened um, I'm in graduate school at Penn, I'm studying cognitive psychology. I'm a National Science Foundation Fellowship. I'm moving along. I have my master's. I'm finishing my PhD work. And I'm going out onto the job market. And the job market in academics is seasonal. So you can only do it in the spring. And I had my uh, job talks lined up. And I got really sick. And I ended up in the hospital for two weeks. And I had to go recuperate. I kind of missed the market. So I had now had to wait a year. So what am I going to do, do during that year? Because you know, I don't have my fellowship now. I'm taking time off. Um, My brother, Howard Letterer, had been playing professionally for 10 years. He had been nice enough to like fly me out to Vegas for a vacation once in a while. And he'd give me like 50 bucks and tell me to go play small stakes poker. I was like saying to my brother, like, I don't know what to do. Like now I have to wait a year. He said, why don't you play poker in the meantime? But wait, do you guys grew up in a card playing household? But not a poker playing household. Yes. But a card card? playing household. Like what? Oh gosh, we played hearts. Um, Something called Oh Hell, which is a little bit of a stripped down version of bridge. We Mm -hmm. played um, a lot of gin. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I was playing bridge with my dad, like by the time I was 14, I was his partner. So we we did play a lot of cards, but poker was sort of my brother's milieu. He started playing when he was 18. So yeah, so he, he said, you know, I think there's some poker games in Montana. You should do that in the meantime. And, you know, 20 years later was the meantime, I guess. I retired in 2012. So I I played for 20 years, 18 of which were as a professional. So one of the things that's interesting about the way you start the book is you say that life is poker, not chess. And you start with a story about Pete Carroll and the Seattle Seahawks. And we are talking to you um, in the week right after we had the Super Bowl. So this is a great story to open with because... I remember watching that game. I remember that Pete Carroll made this call where he was going to throw a pass on second down. Was that right? And the commentators were going like 
like their heads were going to blow up. Like it was the biggest deal in the world and there was an interception. And your point in telling that story is that it wasn't necessary. Everyone said, oh, my God, horrible decision. Worst play ever. Was it a bad decision? Well, it obviously it depends on who you read, but uh, when you look at the really deep mathematical analyses of it, one of the places you can go look is um, Benjamin Morris wrote about it on 538.com. You see that mathematically it looks like a pretty good decision. So you have the coach do something unexpected, which Car- P. Carroll did. Everybody expected him to hand it off to Marshawn Lynch. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, you can read about it in the book or Benjamin Morris, for clock management reasons, for reasons of getting three plays instead of two, the pass actually looks really good, and the interception rate at there is only 1%-ish. So it seems like relatively free to try for it. But of course, it got intercepted, and they lost, and then it was you know the worst call in Super Bowl history. We tend to judge how good a decision something was based on what happened. And you say it had, that sometimes bad luck can occur or good luck can occur. So talk about the difference between a good decision and a bad decision versus the outcome. So resulting is taking the quality of the outcome and using that as the as the sole way to derive the quality of the decision. It's really problematic because look, how are we going to learn? We're going to take these outcomes that we have, the results that we have. You know, we generally are going to try to figure something out about whether the decision was good or not and then make adjustments to the way that we make decisions going forward. And if we stick these things together too tightly, we end up with all this kind of messed up analysis of the way that things worked out. So resulting is really bad. You write, decisions are bets on the future. They aren't right or wrong based on whether they turn out well on any particular iteration. An unwanted result doesn't make our decision wrong if we thought about the alternatives and the probabilities in advance and allocated our resources accordingly. Here is how I want to think about this. Look at the market. has gone berserk. Berserk. Right? <laughs> berserk. Up, down, anywhere. Yes. Right. If somebody were to make the decision... And like, I got a million dollar inheritance, everything's in the account, and said, okay, I've got to put my money to work, puts the money to work, and then has to endure selling on Friday, and then on Monday, and then says, oh my God, I made the worst decision of my life. Well, so hopefully that's not what they say. And I think that you see this all the time, is that you react to these short-term fluctuations. So what I say about that is essentially this, if you think about, say, flipping a coin, If I flip a coin once and it lands heads and you've called heads, that doesn't tell me very much about your coin flipping ability because we only did it one time. I mean, four times doesn't tell me very much. 10,000 times, sure. But we're talking about one market fluctuation. And what you want to do is be more like thinking about what is the long-term trend of the market looks like. So, you know, in the book, I actually show this chart of Berkshire Hathaway. And I say, look, if you if you look at Berkshire Hathaway over the long term, obviously it has this beautiful upward trend. But here's 1130 on a Tuesday in 2008. It looks really bad. So we want to pull ourselves away from getting too caught up in these little tiny outcomes because it's just not enough data. Like It doesn't tell us anything that the market went down on one day. But I think what's fascinating is that in thinking in bets, you basically understand as a poker player that you've got to make disciplined decisions based on the information you have, but you have to recognize you're going to lose a bunch of hands, right? So there's there's two things that determine the way our lives turn out. One is the quality of our decisions. We should do a lot of focus on making sure that that's good. But the other is luck. And, and we don't have anything to do with luck. And there's a lot of it. We can think about something that seems like a really, really skillful decision that we can make. And I can show you how much luck intervenes. Have you ever run a red light? Yes, I have. Did you get in an accident every time? No, my God, thank goodness. Right. Did you get a ticket every time? No. No. Well, do you think that running red lights is a good decision? No. No, because luck intervened, right? So you made this poor decision. I've done it too. I happen to have never gotten a ticket in that situation, but yet I don't think that was a good decision. Nor, by the way, one time I ran a green light and I got in an accident. I don't think that it's a bad decision to run green lights. Mm. So if we take something as simple as how do we get through the intersection of, you know, where it seems like a pretty clear decision and we see how much luck can intervene there, we better get comfortable with the fact that in the short term, luck determines a lot of the way that things turn out. So let's not get too sort of locked into that and let's get much more comfortable with the idea that we're not certain. In the long run, we can look at you know trends and we can sort of be really good data collectors and we can start to do analytics on that. In the short run, 
let's just get comfortable with it and let's really focus on this other thing that determines the way our lives turn out, which is making better decisions. And, and the way to do that is to really do two things. One is to make sure that the beliefs that inform the decisions are really well calibrated. What do you mean by that? Well, so most of us approach the world with the attitude of I want to be right as opposed to I want to be accurate. So I know those sound kind of like the same thing, but they're really different. So wanting to be right is just I want to confirm that my prior is true. So I have this belief. I'm going to go find data that makes sure that, you know, that affirms that my belief is right. And if there's data that maybe would argue against it, I'm going to completely ignore it or discredit it because I just want to feel good about my belief. So Mm -hmm. that's sort of the approaching the world from right. Approaching the world from accurate is saying, I want to have the most accurate representation of the objective truth. Mm. So in order to do that, I have to be really information hungry. And not only do I have to be information hungry, but I better be specifically hungry for information that disagrees with me because I already have my perspective. I already know why I think that what I believe is true. I already have all the information that affirms what I believe. So let me go try to think about why might I be wrong in order to get really good calibration on that belief. So that's at the base of every decision we make. So that's the first step to good decision making. The second step to good decision making is actually to kind of get comfortable with this luck element and say, whatever decision I make, I cannot be sure of how it will turn out. So let me consider, let me try to sort of imagine what all the possible scenarios are that might occur. Let me take a stab at what the probability of those occurring are. Mm -hmm. And then let me start to put in really good action plans in place to sort of deal so I know kind of in advance if things don't work out, here's what my plan's going to be. I'm not so surprised. I'm not so reactive. And then I can also start doing things to try to increase the probability of the good futures and decrease the probability of the bad futures. And then here's the really good thing. As we go back and try to figure out if decision quality was good, well, if I've already imagined all of the futures... Then when the unusual one occurs, say the ball gets intercepted in the end zone, I don't go back and say, well, then the decision must have been bad because I've already got that in in my sort of scenario plan. And I'm like, okay, over here was this 1% right. of an interception. So, okay, I included that in my decision. Right. So this is our tail risk, classic, like mm-hmm. something bad can happen, unexplained, you don't know. How How can we help people who are listening um, be more comfortable with this element of of luck, because I think that this makes people feel really freaked out that they want to believe. For example, people will say, I want to know what the market's doing. Well, you don't know what the market's doing. Like we interviewed this woman who's a neurologist who said, you got to see what happens to the brain when you float when you float uncertainty out there. It's wild. Like the brain goes completely yeah. nutty. We don't like uncertainty. So then we cling to this black and white universe. And as you said, you reinforce your own case. But investing in and of itself, playing poker, these are uncertain activities that we kind of know over the long term, generally speaking, will happen. But at any given time, it can blow up in your face. It can feel horrible. How do we make people more comfortable with that? The short story is to change what it is that makes you feel good. So, of course, uncertainty makes us feel bad. Finding out that something that you believed maybe isn't so accurate doesn't sort of naturally come to us. So what we need to do is figure out a way to change what it is that makes us feel good. So let me give you an example. I'm sure that you've heard this a lot from people, right? Some some horrible thing happens to them and they say, well, I just got unlucky. Mm-hmm. Some great things happen and they say, I'm, I'm so smart. A, I'm so smart. <laughs> right. That That's called self-serving bias, by the way. <laughs> You can see why. But this is a very natural way that we process the world. We like to onboard all the good stuff to skill, and then we like to sort of offload all the kind of bad stuff that happens to us to luck. Mm -hmm. Right? How am I processing my own outcomes? So that's obviously like a short-term hit, right? Like I'm getting a short-term like boost of endorphins and feel good and all of that. You notice that what I'm doing is I'm saying I'm not comfortable with this luck element, so I'm just going to shunt off all the bad stuff to that, Mm -hmm. right? Because that's going to help me to sort of feel better. But what if we change what you reinforce me for? What if I change the rules of the game? And I say that, you know what? What would make me feel really bad is thinking that I'm blaming something on luck that I actually could use to inform my own decision making. And instead, what I want to do is be the best credit giver I can, be the best uh, mistake admitter that I can be. Well, so that's a really nice goal, hard to do on your own. Mm -hmm. So if you get other people to start reinforcing that behavior with you, 
then that's where you're really going to do well. Because in the end, we're all rats in a maze trying to get to the end of the maze and get our little piece of cheese. So ask other people to help you reinforce this stuff. Be the ones who are giving you that pellet. I want to hear a little bit about this group rewards because you're talking about that a little bit on, you know, kind of missing opportunities to examine your decisions and figure out where you do better. And for people who who work in groups, there is a unique opportunity to do this. Let's say I'm a boss and I've got a group of people. I'm listening to this podcast. What can I do to either do a little postmortem or premortem about decision making with the group? So all groups aren't created equal. So we've all heard a lot about echo chambers. That's where groups tend to drift towards. So that's where you as an individual say, I want to confirm my own beliefs. Well, guess what? Groups do that too. Mm. So groups can sort of become this confirmatory thought style if they sort of run on their own without intentionality, right? So um, it's like, oh, we're great and our strategy is great and we're all so smart. And it sort of just becomes a bigger version of the individual. So as a leader, what you want to do is put in place this culture that encourages exploratory thought which means that you have to have this commitment to accuracy over being right. And you also have to be very, very tolerant of dissent. So people have to feel really, really comfortable in giving views that disagree with kind of the prevailing ideas in the room, particularly the ideas of the leader, because people want to feel like they're team players and it's kind of hard to disagree with the leader. Right. So how do you do that? Well, there's two really great things that you can do as a leader that you can um, include in your group in order to encourage dissenting opinions. And they both have to do with how are you defining what being a team player means. So everybody likes to be a team player. Let's go with that. So let's just change the rules of the game so that being a team player has to do with dissenting. Two great strategies. One is red team, blue team. So you have you know, one team that's supposed to argue for the, the prevailing belief, idea, strategy, prediction, whatever it might be. And you have another group of people whose job is to do the best that they can at arguing against. So on that team, on the red team, being a team player is specifically dissenting, being hungry to try to figure out why not as opposed to why. Mm. So that's a great way to do it. The other you mentioned is called a pre-mortem. So a pre-mortem is when you imagine, okay, we, we've decided that we have some goal in mind. We want to increase earnings by X by this time period. And you imagine with the group, you've held up a newspaper and the headline is, we failed at our goal. We did not reach our earnings marks, right? So now what you do is with the group, you say, okay, everybody take out a piece of paper and write down the five reasons that we did not oh, that's reach, great. reach our goal. So again, you've changed the rules of the game, right? And what's really wonderful about that is that you end up with some crazy things that people wouldn't otherwise say in the room. So let's say you're a leader and you're, you're doing this and say, we, we missed our sales mark. Um, we missed our earnings, our earnings goals. Why? You'll get somebody who will literally write down on a piece of paper, you quit, for ah. example. Now, how are you going to get somebody to say that otherwise? So now, as a leader, you can say, that's great. Like, I quit. I died. I you know, right. got promoted out of this team. Let's not be surprised if that happens. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to, but let's not be surprised if that happens. Let's figure out what are you going to do as a team if that happens. And now you can put these plans in place where you're no longer reactive to bad things that might happen, even very unexpected ones, and you become much more nimble and prepared. So the pre-mortem allows you to, you know, if you think about a painting, you have the positive space, right? That's mm -hmm. the rah, rah, let's think about why our plan will work. And then, but you wanna fill that out with the negative space. So change the rules of the game. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Yeah, you gotta change the rules of the game. You know who changed the rules of the game? Our sponsor, Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. Betterment has been on the forefront of figuring out how to use technology to help you better manage your investment needs. Betterment offers low, transparent advisory fees compared to traditional services. In fact, what they're trying to do is keep your costs down, improve your tax efficiency, and let you sleep at night. You know, you sleep at night when you know you've got this efficient way of managing your assets. Betterment takes advanced investment strategies and uses technology to deliver them to their hundreds of thousands of customers. So it doesn't really matter where you are in your investment life. Maybe you're starting out. Maybe you've got millions of dollars. Doesn't matter. 
To learn more, just go to Betterment.com slash better off. That's Betterment.com slash better off. Betterment, rethink what your money can do. And now back to our interview with Annie Duke. When I was uh, a practicing financial planner, that's what a financial plan is. It is actually a pre-mortem. Mm-hmm. It is saying, what if every assumption you're making doesn't hold true? And I remember a client once saying to me, like, you're so cynical. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I'm not so cynical. But like, well, you're just talking about what if I got disabled? What if I were to die? What happens if instead of getting 8% return, I got 4% return? There's a sense that I have that 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 was really that was my job because you don't want to think that. So let me think that for you exactly. or let me at least open it up. Right. Right. So let's not get totally surprised and unprepared for if we get disabled or we don't get the return that we were expecting or the market goes down a thousand points in one day. Let's think about that in advance and have plans in place. So let me think about, well, you know, there are going to be days where the market crashes. So I'm going to decide in advance that on those days, I'm not going to react to it because one day doesn't really matter. I'm investing for the long term. So that would be an example of sort of preparing for the worst. Uh, You have uh, some great questions. I just want to give, uh, because I love these questions, especially for people who have rocked solid black and white beliefs, especially about their financial lives, because they think it's this concrete thing that is right. not about luck. And sometimes it often is. Well, it's very much about luck. Exactly. <laughs> Why might my belief not be true? What other evidence might be out there bearing on my belief? Are there similar areas I can look toward to gauge whether similar beliefs to mine are true? What sources of information could I have missed or minimized on the way to reaching my belief? What are the reasons someone else could have a different belief? What's their support? And why might they be right instead of me? What other perspectives are there as to why things turned out the way they did? And you say that basically just by asking these questions, you're going to move to a whole different plane. Yeah, so that that's actually... That list of questions is exactly what thinking in bets is about. So I think we've all had the experience of saying, you know, oh, I'm sure that that market is going to, you know, go up tomorrow because of blah, whatever it is, right? Whatever, plug in your reasons. And somebody says to you, oh, do you want to bet? And what happens is that you move off of shore into those questions that I, I list there, that it forces you to start thinking about, again, the world as uh, an accuracy game as opposed to a right game. So once I've challenged you to bet, it makes you go through this whole vetting process of the beliefs that are informing the decision that you, you, you're you about to make. And it makes you go through and think, well, why might I be wrong? What do they know that I don't know? All those things that it tells you that you're supposed to back off sure into, well, as opposed to I'm sure, the question should really be how sure am I? Because that really tells me how much I'm willing to risk on this. And what a beautiful thing to do because the fact is that that idea of I'm not sure is just a much more accurate representation of a world where, of course, there's hidden information. We don't have all the facts about anything. And there's luck in the way that the future unfolds. You can't be sure of anything about the way the future unfolds. And that's even when we know the math for sure. If I know that a coin is 50-50, I still don't know if it's going to flip heads or tails on the next one. So let's all be I'm not sure a lot more. I love that. Um, I My first job, I was an options trader and in the gold, silver, and copper options pits on the Commodities Exchange of New York. You know, so I know enough statistics to be dangerous, not probably as much as you. And um, I remember when I was clerking, we started getting our mm-hmm. training. We're running down the positions and we're looking at outcomes and we're looking at this Black Shoals model and what's the outcome and what's the likelihood and percentage of loss. And my boss, we, we sort of hand my boss like what we think where we are. And the boss looks at me, he goes, you want to bet your job on this number right now? You're telling me I'm long six futures. Are you want to bet your job on that? And I stopped and I, he looked at me, he goes, I'm serious. If this number's not right, you're going to be fired. I took the, the thing back. I ran it five more times. I came back and I said to myself, oh, crap, well, I'm as sure as I'm going to be. Yes. He's like, OK, I just want to make sure that you double check, triple check, because in the middle of the trading session, you, I need you to ask yourself that. Would I bet my job on this number? Yeah, so that, that's such a great story, by the way. And I, I would like to be able to borrow it. Because Anytime. It, it's such a good demonstration. What a bet does is it acts like an accountability mechanism for your beliefs. It, it forces you to be accountable to the things that you believe. And if you have, if we have a clash of beliefs, it acts like a referee. 
what I say in the book is obviously like, you know, outside of you're on the floor um, or you're at a poker table, we probably don't want to go around challenging our friends or colleagues to bets all the time. So the way we want to do it is through good group decision making. So we want to include in the group this accountability mechanism that you're going to be held accountable to the things that you believe. And if two people disagree, there's going to be somebody refereeing that acting like a bet without actually making people put money on the table. I was just listening to Ezra Klein's podcast, and he had a guy on as his guest who said, you've been very critical of me, and that's why I wanted to invite you on my podcast. And I think that's really hard to do. How do you manage finding those people and listening to the feedback and not getting dragged down into the mud? If you're excited when you hear somebody who you know is really smart make you think a little bit differently, if that's what gets you off, that is how you get there. It's saying, do I want to be living on 1130 on a Tuesday on that chart where that little downtick just makes me so sad that I can't play for the long run and get just that upward trend to how things go over my, my life? Because we know if we become better decision makers as we go along, if we're, if we're making good decisions as we go along, our, our lives have a very high probability of going pretty well. Right. They might not because luck can intervene. Absolutely. For sure. But we're increasing the probability that things are going to go pretty well for us. So that's what we want to do. We want to be thinking about the long term. What you recognize is that if that's the goal that I have, I must figure out how to calibrate my beliefs. I must figure out how to moderate my beliefs. And I can only do that by finding people who are super smart who disagree with me, and listen to them. And I'm willing to take that kind of short-term, ooh, that didn't feel good, because I know that in the long run, it's going to make me so much better. So first of all, change that mindset for yourself. And second of all, again, find a great group who's really committed to this exploratory thinking with you so that when you go up to them and you say, you know what, it felt kind of bad in the moment, but this person disagreed with me, and my initial thought was like, ugh, you're just dumb. But then I really dug down into it, and you know what? I changed my mind a little, and you say to me, that's amazing. Wow, I imagine that that was really hard. And also, by the way, thank you for sharing that perspective with me because that's now helped me. And all of these things, because we get so much reinforcement from that positive social interaction and feeling like our peers and our friends and people we respect also respect us back. Uh, do you still play poker for fun, even though you're no longer a professional? So I retired in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, I do play um, to raise money for charity. It, it is an amazing way to raise money for charity. Um, I've done it for quite a few, including the one that I founded called How I Decide, and we do a big poker tournament. That's cool. For that every year, and it's it's a super fun way to raise money. What about chess? Do you play chess or not? My brother is actually was a master. He he was really serious about chess. It's the way he got into poker. So he moved to New York to study with a grandmaster when he was eighteen years old, and then kind of. Uh, you know, all the, you know, backgammon, chess, poker, it's all kind of intertwined with yep. each other. That's how he made his way to the poker table. I played a little bit when I was younger, um, but my brother was really much more the chess player. I mean, I, I can I can play okay. Okay, best game to teach you about life? Well, I think poker, for okay. sure, because poker has this amazing element of hidden information and luck. And then I'm going to say that I'm not just saying that because I'm a poker player. So there's a guy named John von Neumann. He's the father of game theory. Certainly anybody in markets knows about game theory. So really, really important to the way that we think about these kinds of strategic choices and decision making when there's multiple people involved in the decision. He developed game theory along with Os Oscar Morgenstern, you know, the theory of games, which is such an important book. He developed it on a stripped down version of poker. So I'm just not saying like, oh, I'm a poker player. Of course, poker is the best game. It's actually from an academic standpoint, when we think about game theory, that sprung out of thinking about poker as a model. I just so delighted that you are here. And this book is fantastic. So we end every interview with a bookend question to our first one. You said, Probably the best thing you did money-wise is not to make some decision. Right. I probably don't even know what it was. That, I mean, that's the thing. It's probably just where I didn't do something with my money. How about your worst money decision? Well, okay. So I would say probably my worst money decision is not realizing early in life that probably renting is better than buying. You know, I always thought, well, you're supposed to own a house. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I had enough of uh, enough kind of spare money to be able to put that all into a house, I did. 
And now I kind of realize in retrospect, well, why wasn't I renting and then diversifying that money? The first house I bought, I think, is the worst decision that I ever made. And, I, you know, it's, I, it's not like I lost money on it. I just think that why was I putting all my money into one, into one asset category? And not just one asset category, but only one asset in the category. And it was everything that, you know, it was basically all the spare money that I had. So I wish that I had just not had that idea that I needed to own. And I would say that's probably my worst decision. Annie Duke, thank you so much. The name of the book is Thinking in Bets. Go out and get it. We will link to it. You are a delight. And I never want to play poker uh, sitting across from you. I want to be on your team. (laughs) Okay. Well, there's no teams in poker, but okay. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much to Annie Duke, a great guest. Go get the book, Thinking in Bets. We'll have a link to it in our show notes. Don't forget, we drop new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. You can just go to JillOnMoney.com to figure out how to download it. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. We're distributed by Cadence 13. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. And Betterment is our sponsor. Talk to you next week.